Hello and welcome. As the Green Belt movement grew in Africa, she became known as the Tree Mother. Her tireless efforts to save the environment and to promote women's rights won her the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004, making her the first African woman to receive the honor. This week on One on One, meet activist and Nobel laureate Wangari Matai. She was born and raised within a farming family in Kenya, but showed academic talent at an early age while being educated by Catholic missionaries. Wangari Mathai's studies took her to the US and Germany before she returned home to become the first Kenyan woman to receive a doctorate. She developed an appetite for political activism, campaigning against corruption and human rights abuses under the regime of Daniel Arap Moy. The Green Belt movement Mathai founded provided work for women while protecting the environment by planting trees. In 2002, she was elected to the Kenyan parliament and continued to promote green issues from within the government. Now honored with the Nobel Peace Prize for her efforts towards sustainable development and human rights, Mathai remains energetic even as she approaches her 70s, continuing to spread her environmental message across Africa. Dr. Wangari Matai, what a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, Liz. Thank you. Yeah. You know, in, in, in the three decades or so since you started uh, the Green Belt Movement, you've planted, what, 30, 30 million plus trees, you know. Have you noticed a real difference? Has there been, in, that, in those three decades, a big change in people's attitudes toward the environment? Has your campaigning showed a visible return? Yes, it has. The, those 40 million uh, trees are planted by literally thousands of people, individuals, especially women, and they have transformed th their farms, their countrysides. Yes, visible. And also in the, pro in the process, we have uh, made our presence felt in the corridors of power so that laws have been, been introduced to protect the environment. And the politicians have been made to be more accountable about the way they manage the environment. How do you, when you're looking long term, you're planning for the future of the planet, they're planning for their future re-election, which is a matter of years, how do you manage to get through to the politicians to make the difference? They don't tend to look anywhere near as far as you do. That is, indeed is the problem with the environment, that it is the, the, the generation that destroys the environment is usually not the generation that pays the price because the, the process of degeneration is very slow. So within a generation, you can do a lot of damage and not realize. And only in the second or third generation will people realize what the second or third generation before them did. And, and so because politicians are concerned about today and tomorrow, about survival, about being re-elected, that's the struggle that the environmentalists are always having to deal with. I know people label you the tree woman or the tree mother of Africa, mm -hmm. but it, does it do you justice? You do much more than just trees. Well, many people don't understand that uh, the tree is just an entry point. It's an easy point because it is something that people understand that can people can do. It's not very expensive to do it, and you don't need too much technology to do it. But once we get into the community through tree planting, then we do a lot of other issues. We deal with issues of governance, issues of human rights, issues of conflicts and peace, issues of long-term resource management. And, uh, and that usually is the part of the movement that people don't see. Of course, with the, uh, the honor of the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, you were awarded in 2004, and congratulations, of course, on that. How much has it helped boost what you're doing? Have you found it's really made a lot of difference? I know you're out and about doing the talks and everything, but are the people listening more? Well, I definitely, and unfortunately, the Nobel Peace Prize is such a wonderful gift. It opened a lot of doors. It makes many people who would have ignored you listen to you. It makes people think twice about what they are doing when you are warning. And so I have found myself talking more to people who otherwise would not have talked, having people invite me into their circles, invite me into their decision making, and inviting me to participate in uh, trying to protect, for example, the Congo forest in a way that they would not have. I am the Goodwill Ambassador of the Congo Forest, and I was made the Goodwill by 10 African heads of states in that uh, region of Africa. Before the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, I don't think they would have paid me many, much attention, but with the prize, they can see that it is much easier to draw attention not only to that forest, but also to the other major forests in Southeast Asia, in the Amazon, 
and in many other countries where forests are under threat. Let's take me back, to, uh, you know, take us back through your life. I have to say, it's hard to believe you were born in 1940. You have incredible vitality. You've seen a lot of change, obviously, in this time, and uh, not just in Africa, but obviously in the, the, the approach to environmentalism, certainly in recent years. But tell me about those early years when you were first discovering the world around you. What are your strongest childhood memories? Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think that um, some of the memories I have, I definitely did not know that I was being introduced into the world and environment. But I grew up in a countryside, in a, in a little village, uh, and I used to draw water from the river. And I remember, uh, as I have said many times, looking at frog eggs and thinking that they were beads that I could adorn myself with, uh, trying to pick them and they would break, the jelly would break, and I was frustrated because I really thought maybe I was not handling them properly. And then later on, finding the tadpoles and wondering where all these come from and trying to catch them, and then having them disappear without knowing that they become frogs. So for me, that, that, the fact that that was very early in my life and I remembered, I think that was the beginning of my introduction into understanding how nature operates and being fascinated by things nat natural. And so later on, I became a student of biology and, and that just intensified that understanding. I know you place a lot of uh, value on what your education from your mother. Tell me about her. I mean, I know she made you appreciate your surroundings, your environment, and, and really understand the world better. Tell me about her and the relationship you had with her. Well, she was a, a wonderful woman, like most mothers are to their children. You, one doesn't quite always appreciate how much you, you take from your mother. But in our culture, young girls become almost like little women very early in life because they are helping their mothers with all types of course. And so with my mother, uh, fetching firewood, cultivating with her in the field, looking for, for fetching water for her, going to the market for her, just running the ordinary errands, taking care of my uh, brothers and sisters uh, really made me appreciate life very early and it also made me very responsible very early. Sometimes it's surprising to me how much I was doing when I was barely a child or even an uh, early teenager. And, uh, and so when I go to America at the age of 20, I'm thinking I'm a full grown woman and I'm thinking I can handle it. Today I would be afraid of sending my own daughter to the US at 20. But that very much is the way my, my mother had brought me up. You fight a lot for women's empowerment, of course, I, and I know we've described your relationship with your mother. What about your father? My father was a very different kind of a person, again, very typical African man of that time, a polygamist, uh, and also a man who was kind of distant as far as children were concerned. So I, I find that I could not relate to my, my father. But I, I also found it very interesting that as he grew older, and in fact, when he started playing with my children, he was much more calmer and much more willing to accommodate children running all over him, something we didn't do when he himself was raising us. So I guess it was probably the pressure of work and the responsibility of a, of a young husband in an African setting. But I do regret the fact that I was not as close to my father as I was to my mother. I wonder what I would have learned that I missed from my father. What about the relationship between the different wives? Was there much kind of a, a community culture between all your uh, father's wives? Yes, I think that uh, especially since uh, polygamy is so demonized now, uh, especially since the colonial era, I sometimes find it amazing because I do find some aspects of the polygamous life very, uh, very nice. For example, I, <clears throat> of course, we are all taught now especially to think that polygamy brings in a lot of jealousies and a lot of inter uh, fighting among the women. I didn't see that as I was growing up. If they had, they kept it to themselves. I also found something that I now find missing in our society, and that is the protection of the children. I really think that that situation and maybe the family structure at that time really protected children. When you go to our country now and find these miserable street children scavenging from dump sites, completely abandoned, you really want to wonder whether you have not lost something very wonderful in the traditional family structure where children were protected and where no matter what was happening between the parents and or between the wives, 
children were protected and people took a collective responsibility towards protecting children and ensuring that they grow up in a safe and secure environment. Now I know that it was a very male-dominated uh, society and as you say your father was a typical African male of the time. It was interesting though to hear one time you were telling the story of your brother coming and asking why you weren't, as a sister, weren't getting an education. Which clearly shows you that men are not always biased. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. He was a nice little man <laughs> who had not yet been indoctrinated. <laughs> and so he's asking, how come she's also a child? And indeed it was thanks to my brother that, uh, that I went to school and thanks to the fact that my mother and eventually my father, none of them raised an objection. Uh, although I am quite sure that some people may have told them that they were wasting their money sending me to school because I wasn't going to be uh, much, much more than just a wife having children. Well, I proved them wrong. Very much so. Stay with us. We're going to just take a short break here, Dr. Wangari. We're back with more one-on-one -on -one in just a moment.